Well, it's good to be here, folks. Amen. When I think of all the places I could be, and here I am, by the grace of God. I didn't find him, he found me. He came to me. <laughs> yes, if you have your Bibles, I hope you have. If you turn the book of Genesis with me. Genesis. Bereshit in Hebrew. Chapter number 3. Genesis 3 and verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Father, bless this holy book now. Your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now there's a lot of... A lot of uh, vitriol casted against this book. Uh, the Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, Williams, William Jennings Bryan uh, was the, uh, was the uh, he was candidate for president one time and he stood for the, uh, for the Bible, said he believed the word of God. Clarence Darrow was called in to, he was, a, I think he was from uh, somewhere in, the, in the New England and he didn't believe the Bible. And so therefore it was a, uh, uh, it was a, it was a debate over the Bible over the veracity of the scripture, whether you could believe it or not. And there are many out there today who do not believe in the creation of man that's recorded in the Bible. I do. Amen. Man was made Amen. in the image of God, according to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Yeah. We have a serpent that shows up. Now here, don't make the mistake, a lot of people do, and I know it's popular in the culture to see a snake wrapped around a tree yeah. and an apple. Neither one are present here. It has nothing to do with a snake. The Hebrew word translated serpent here is nachash. That's a brilliant, shining thing that's up walking on, all, on two, two, two feet, two legs, and has the ability to speak. That's important. That's very important. And you find the old Jewish sages, uh, they believed in this. They believed in what's said here. They believed their Bible. And they also include here a creature called Lilith. How many ever heard of Lilith? L-I-T-H. Lilith is considered to be a demon, but uh, she is introduced as a um, possible, uh, a possible uh, for, a tri for, a, for a triangle here to, uh, to, uh, to come in along with Eve and uh, possibly produce some children with Adam. Now, whether this happened or not, I do not know, but I do know this. I do know that when we read the Bible, uh, don't make the mistake of taking what you've read in the Bible and apply it to what you know in this generation today in 2023. The book goes back a long way. And it goes back to a place where a serpent can speak. The curse placed upon this serpent is that it was to crawl on its belly. Therefore, it was to crawl on the ground. And even in the restoration during the millennium, when all the animal creation is restored, the serpent is still going to eat dust. He said, because you've done this thing. And uh, so it crawls on the ground. In Ezekiel chapter number 28, we read about the anointed cherub that covereth. How many of you remember reading about that? In Ezekiel 28, the anointed cherub that covereth, I believe, is Satan. But I believe it is before he was Satan. The word Satan is a Hebrew word which simply means adversary. Satan, a Satan, an adversary. It's a generic term, but it also becomes a name of an individual thing. So in Ezekiel chapter number 28, we find out that Satan was an anointed cherub. And he said that covereth. So here we have a creature, and they're all creatures. God's the only creator. Everything else is a creature that has an animal identity. Because when you read in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 1 and chapter number 10, you'll find out that a cherubim has the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the yeah. face of a man, the face of an eagle. Right. Therefore, it's associated with the creation. But now think about this for a moment. A cherubim is older than, a fox, than an ox. Right. It's older than an eagle. Yeah. It's older than yeah. a man. It's older than all these creatures. Yet it has the identity of these creatures. So what does that mean? It may very well mean that it took on that identity once they were made. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But it's one of those things in the Bible that you need to look at in order to make you think. Because the Bible, folks, is not a little simple book. 
When it talks about the serpent here, the apostle says, as the serpent beguiled Eve. Yes. He beguiled Eve. Yes. He tricked her. Yes. And uh, don't let your minds be uh, beguiled from the simplicity of the gospel. So what's going on here now, folks, I laid the foundation for all of this, is the fall of man. The fall of man. Yes. Why did he fall? Well, remember reading about the serpent or the Satan over there in, in, in Ezekiel chapter number 28. He was made, he was a beautiful creature. Right. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. Yes. He led the choir of heaven. Right. He was all kinds of musical instruments and tablets and all of that made up his identity. Right. But he fell. Yes. Now, when that fall took place, we don't know. Nowhere in the Bible does it exist. Does it specifically name it? I've given you messages before about the eventual fall of Satan as he comes down, down, down. But when God makes the man in Genesis yep. chapter number three, chapter number two, let us make man in our image after our likeness. You can be certain that that, that, that serpent or that Nahash was standing right there watching everything that took place. Wow. Watching it, watching it, and trying to determine exactly what God had in mind. What's he doing? So what we have here then is a confrontation between Satan who has fallen now in this place and the man that has been created in the image of God. You have an animosity now. You have hatred now. You have a personal conflict now. This creature despises the man and the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, what is man thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visiteth him. You made him a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Man was created just a little lower than the angels, but that's not where his final destiny will be. No, no, no. He will be in Christ in God and no angel is that. But we have this. Now, the reason this is important is because this sets a theme for the whole Bible. It lays the foundation for what's going to happen throughout all 66 books of the scripture because Satan's purpose is to destroy that man and the way he's going to destroy that man is to destroy the image of God in that man. As I've said to you before, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that anything is made in the image of God except the man. Now, I can't come along and say that, the, if, if, that they are, they're not, but nowhere does it say they are. That's important yes. because man is made in the image of God. When man sinned, he lost that image partially. This is why the Bible says in the book of Genesis 5 that Adam had a son in his image, in his own image. He bore a child, brought it into this world in his image. Yes. It doesn't say in the image of God. It says in his image. Why? Because he had passed on to him According to what Romans chapter number five says, for by, for by one man death entered the world and yes. death by sin. So Adam handed to his son death. He's the first Adam. The last Adam gave us life. Amen. And we know these things. We've studied the Bible, understand that. So during that time of what we call the antediluvian period, it's before the flood, before the deluge, a man finally shows up and his name is Noah. His name means rest. He is a direct descendant of Adam through Seth, not Cain. There's two separate bloodlines that show up here in the book of Genesis. This is why Lilith is introduced to us. And I'm not saying today or tonight that I'm necessarily uh, in, in agreement with what these, that these Jewish rabbis are teaching. But I also read the Bible and I take everything I get a hold of and I do some comparisons with it, pray over it, and study it and give it time if the Holy Spirit will show uh, me what he wants me to see in this because there's a lot going on, okay. an awful lot going on. Why do you say that? It says in the book of Genesis chapter number six that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. He saw the daughters of men. They came into them. The scripture says there were giants in those days. Giant is uh, translated from the Hebrew word Nephilim, which is a plural word. It comes from the Hebrew verb Nafal, which means to fall. So they are falling creatures. What are they? They're half human and half angelic being. What kind of an angelic being? The scripture says the angels that kept not their first estate. All right. But they left that first estate. And when they did, they were judged and cast into the lowest hell, which is Tartarus. 
Tartarao is the word. They were cast into this. They left it and came to the daughters of men. So what's the problem? The problem is that they are corrupting the image of God in man. I don't think that this is an accident. I think it's by purpose to corrupt the image of God. The main reason is in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15, seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman, seed of the woman, which of course it's impossible biologically for the woman to have the seed. So it means that there must be an intervention from God. And he does intervene. Yes. But that seed does not come from a man. No. That seed comes from God. And that's one of the miracles of the virgin birth. But he goes after the seed of the woman <laughs> in, the book of, in the book of Genesis. So what happens? God finds Noah. And the Bible said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All right. Why? Because his perfect in his generations, and the word perfect is tanim in Hebrew. What does that mean? That means that from Adam unto Noah, there was no interruption in that bloodline of angels. He was a perfect human being from Noah. That's what he was. Now I've given you a lot of wild stuff tonight. Now if you want to if you want to, if you want to, <laughs> a lot of folks say, good night, man, what a crazy bunch in that church. No, the truth of the matter is it creates questions and answers questions. Right. And one of the things that I try my dead level best to do with the Bible is make it interesting. Right. And you'd be surprised, folks. Yes. You'd be surprised at what happens when you begin to study the Bible and it begins to open up to you. You see, these angels, these angels that kept not their first estate, God judged them. They left their first estate, their house, their oikon. And they left it, and they came into the daughters of men, bore children. The children were Nephilim, Nafal, called giants. Now, that's one of the easiest things in the world to prove, as far as the giant is concerned. They're everywhere. They're all over the place. Even here in America, the Indians talked about red-headed giants that were uh, seven, eight, nine feet tall. In, in, uh, in, uh, in I think it's uh, uh, New Mexico, uh, there's a cave out there, and in that cave... They had some giants, and, they, and, and the giants were killing people and eating them. They were cannibals, and the Indians had enough of it. And so they came, uh, what, if, if I, could, I didn't write it down. I wish I could remember the name of that cave. But anyway, they came to that cave, drove those giants in it, and they killed them. They shut them off, and here's the thing. You can go into that cave today and find skulls and bones of giants that were seven, eight, nine feet tall. You can believe what the Indians said. You can believe them. There were giants in the earth in those days. And of course, the Bible talks about Og, King of Bashan, talks about how big his bedstead was, and the other giants. And of course, we know that uh, David fought a what? A midget. <laughs> a midget. <laughs> yeah. Goliath of Gath. What was he? Well, he was a giant. He was a giant. He certainly was. And so the giants in the Bible present another theme runs all through the scripture. We don't have time for that tonight. But the point is, something has to do with reproduction that's going on in this world. That's what's important. Something going on with reproduction. Now, a lot of these people that have been, uh, you know, they, 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 they call them, uh, I figure what it is, of the fifth kind. What is it when, the, when a, a, a UFO comes down and an alien takes you? Uh, and they and they carry your body up, and you go up into their into their craft, and then they and then they they come they take your body apart, uh, as, well you know figuratively speaking to figure out how you reproduce, and uh, and this is uh, and this and a lot of people say that they've had this happen to them. Well, you know people think well that's crazy. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Remember this: Satan can transform himself into a what? In the book of Revelation 12, he's called a great red. In the book of Job, he's called Leviathan. Over and over again throughout the Bible, different things are used to describe Satan, even transforming himself to a minister of righteousness. Why? Because he's a spirit being that has the ability to transform himself into something different than what he is. And this is what we've got in Genesis, the Nakash that shows up and talks to the woman. And he beguiled her, he tricked her, and she bought into it. And so because of that, then he put his, he put his uh, hooks into her. And the intent was to destroy the image of God in man. When the Lord Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, the Bible said he was the express image of God. Let's look at some of those scriptures because it's important to, 
to, to understand these things. Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 49. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. Here's what it says. As we have borne the image of the earthy, that's Adam, first Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And who is that? That's Christ. Yes. yes. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 18, it says this. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. The Apostle Paul says, But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See this transformation? For what? For the one who changed. Look at Colossians 1.15. We're going to let you move around a little bit now in the New Testament. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 15. Look at this. Scripture is talking about the kingdom of his son, verse 13, whom we have redemption, verse 14, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Firstborn not in a creature himself, firstborn in the place he has over creation. For the Bible tells you plainly in verse number 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the very image of an invisible God. Now you've seen Hebrews. I've taken you there before. Turn there again with me tonight. Chapter number one. As I've told you before, the old timers used to use this scripture right here and use it alone to lead people to the Lord. There's not a Jehovah's Witness on the face of the earth that can handle this scripture. They don't exist. They can't handle it. Look at verse one. God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory. Yes. All right? <clears throat> it means light from light. All right? Light from light. God the Father is light. Yes. In him is no darkness at all. Who's the Lord Jesus Christ? He's the light that came from the light. That's who he is. All right, his glory. Now look at verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory. Now look at this. And the express. Express is character. Exact image of his person. The word person is hypostasis. What's that mean? That's what's called the joining together of God and flesh. It's called the hypostatic union. What's that mean? That means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the very image of the essence of God. Amen. Amen. Shining forth for Amen. us. This is why he could say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. I and the Father are one. That's what he says. There's no higher deity than this because there's only one God. So he is the very shining forth, the light from the light, the very exact image of of an invisible being who is God the Father. Yes. All right? And so this is what's called the hypostatic union. Now look, he is the image. So what happens? We are made in the image of Christ. Look at Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 10. Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed. In other words, you have been created anew in knowledge after the image of him that created him and his image. We've borne the image of the earthy, we'll bear the image of the heavenly. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the very image of God. Now look at 1 John chapter number 3. And this is, a, this is quite a thing to make you think here. Now look at 1 John chapter number 3. Verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. They may know you physically, but they don't have a clue who you really are, because they don't know your essence now. Why? Because your essence now is in completely and entirely different from theirs. They are of the earth 
earthy. That's all they have. When an unsaved man dies, his life force, the life from God, not the life of God, but the life from God goes back to God who gave it. What's he left with? Nothing. He's got a dead body. When God made Adam, he did not have a dead body. He had a body that had never lived. Adam's body was not dead. Now that's something, <laughs> that's something to think about. And then when he breathed into that body, yes. the breath of life, he became a living soul. See the creation and the beginning of it? Now look at verse number two. Beloved, now are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now why did the apostle write this? Look at this. Yes. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All right? As he appears. Yeah. Now there's a thing called the second coming of Christ. How many have ever heard about that? <laughs> All right. There's a mystery of that second coming of Christ, which is called in 1 Corinthians 15. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. What's that called? That's the rapture. That's the mystery. 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain caught up together with them. The clouds meet the Lord in the air. All right. But then there is also the second advent which is at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble or the seven-year period of tribulation. That's called the parousia, all right? The parousia, what does that mean? That means the manifestation. Yeah. That means to make known. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter number eight that we're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The world is, the creation is. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth until now. If you don't believe it's groaning and, to, and, and travailing, get on YouTube and go out, into the, go out into Africa somewhere down there and watch those lions as they chase the impala around. See what happens when they catch one and you'll find out if the groaning and the moaning that's going on. Or go down here to, Afri uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Florida and go back into the swamp and see what happens when an alligator and a, uh, and a Burmese python lock horns. Sometimes the python wins, sometimes the alligator wins. Right. Just depends. They're both apex predators, top of the line, see? Yeah. But, the, uh, but the python was brought in, all right? If that's not a dog fight, I don't know what is. This is what he's talking about in Romans 8. In plainer words, the curse of sin affects everything there is in creation, even the animal kingdom, and the animals are not sinners, no. see? They're not accountable, no. but they, are, they pay the penalty of the curse of sin upon this earth. So when the manifestation of the sons of God takes place, this is what he's talking about in, in 1 John chapter number three. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now look at 2 Corinthians with me. 2 Corinthians. All right. Chapter number five. Verse 1, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, all right, that's what he calls it. This is the earthly house of this tabernacle, all right? What is the tabernacle? The tabernacle is a place where something dwells. The tabernacle of God was where the Lord God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. Now, if this tabernacle, house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. All right. We get that after we've slept in the grave for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. You don't believe that, do you? I don't believe it either. Not at all. I don't believe in soul sleep. Why? Keep reading. We in this groan earnestly desire to be clothed with, upon with our house which is from heaven. Yeah. If so, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Yeah. Now he that hath wrought for us the self same thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit. See that? That has to do with you leaving this body and to be present with the Lord. Look at the next verse. Verse six. Therefore, we are always confident. 
knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, in this tabernacle, we do groan. That's right. yeah. We are absent from the Lord. Yes, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and where? Right. Present with the Lord immediately. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And so this is what happens when you're in the flesh. Here we are. We're in the flesh tonight. I don't know how long I'll be in the flesh tonight. Have no idea. Have no idea how long I'll be here. I've been here a lot longer than a lot of people. And, but there's been a lot of people been here longer than I have. You know, we all, wouldn't have, none of us know how long we're going to be here. But we know this. We know that when we leave this flesh, we will be with the Lord. Not out here in the ground. Not in the ground. Not in the ground. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen. But we're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. What is that? That is when he comes with his saints. He comes with his saints. They're manifested. They're made known. They're seen. And here's what the apostle is talking about in 1 in in John. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Okay? Now compare what you just read. Did you not just read? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You just read that, right? Amen. And you have a body, an eternal body, right? Yes. But then there's more to it. Oh, yeah. he, oh, said, yeah. he said, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Well, we know that much. Uh -huh. So obviously there's more to know than that. Oh, yeah. That's what we're trying to say tonight. Oh, yeah. And the more to know, of course, is when he comes and the sons of God are manifested, yeah. we're one of them. I'm one of yeah. them. See, and yeah. so this is what Pete, uh, uh, John's talking about. Read it again. Yeah. First, uh, First John chapter three, yeah. verse two. Beloved, now we're the sons of God. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Amen. Yeah. So what's that? What are you trying to say to me tonight, preacher? I have no idea what the final glorified state is going to look like. But I do know this. I do know it will be in the image of the Son of the living God. In the image that he allows for us. What he has for us. Do I, is there any way I become God? No, you can't become God. And you can't cease being God. Think about it. God is an eternal, absolute, almighty being that changes not. He does not change. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, when God came down and took a body of flesh, he incarnated himself. He didn't just put on a robe of flesh and then take it off one day and that was it. No, sir. He became flesh. That meant that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ will be forever the body of God. Amen. 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 And I got to thinking about that today and I was thinking about his blood it says over there in Revelation chapter number one, once you look in verse number, I think it's verse five, look over there with me tonight. And I, this is just something I want you to think about. I get on these things and start thinking. And I think a little while and I get tired, let give my mind a break and quit thinking and then start thinking again. Yeah. Okay, now look at verse number five, Revelation one. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and loosed us from our sins in his own blood. So your Bible doesn't read like that, does it? I hope it doesn't. Because <laughs> if your Bible says loosed, trade it in and get you, as those folks set up in the country, get you a real Bible. <laughs> he washed us from our sins in his own blood. All right, now is he still doing that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's still doing that? Oh, yeah. Does that mean oh, that yeah. if, uh, if, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Cleanse us in what? Blood. Is that blood therefore still Amen. in existence? Amen. Yes, it is, folks, and it forever will be. Forever. He said to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Who? God. God has blood. 
Well, here's what I was thinking about. I thought, now, you know, when he died on the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ shed blood. There's no question about it, folks. When he was, when he was beaten half to death by Pontius Pilate and his crowd, uh, scourged, uh, he shed blood. Sure and when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, yes. he shed blood. Yes. All right, was the blood then the blood of God? Yes. Of course it was. Yes. Of course it was. Yes. Is the blood of God the blood of God? Yes. Okay. Yes. Did he not say in Acts chapter number 2, Thou wilt not suffer thine holy one to see what? Corruption. 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 Three days. And when he came back, all right, he did not, he did not uh, you know, he didn't have to heal the body or do anything. He just simply came back into it. It was, for, it was there. Did he bring blood with him? No, the blood was already there. Yeah. Did he take blood into hell? What for? If anybody tells you, that he had to do something in hell to save you or pay for your sins, you're listening to a rank heretic. That's right. It was done at the cross, folks. That's right. He said it's finished, and that means it's done. That's right. It cannot be added to no, at the cross. Please. So here's my question for you tonight. What, what happened to that blood? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, Pardon? Do you, is there blood in heaven? Well, of course it is. He entered into his own, yeah. with his own blood. Sure he did. He did. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but it was his own blood, he said in Hebrews. He entered in the presence of God. But this is just to mess you up before you leave tonight. <laughs> did he lose any of that blood? It's just, think about stuff like that. Did he lose one drop of it? So it is the supernatural blood, wasn't it? It was the blood of a man, but it was supernatural blood. His body was, his body was the blood of a man, but it was still, it was still no other blood like his blood. And that blood's in heaven. And when a soul is, 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 is saved... Uh, he washes us from our own sin. And not only that, but in your, in, your, in your fellowship with the Lord, you know, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. How does he do it? He does it with his blood. Okay, well, that, therefore the blood becomes, a, becomes an eternal, permanent witness that will never change, the blood of Christ. What I, well, I don't know what, if I ought to say it or not, but, uh, because I don't really have an answer for it, but it's one of those things that, uh, that I was thinking about uh, you know, when he did die and he shed his blood, the Bible said as it were great drops of blood falling from his face, right? Yeah. They've got a term for that, a medical term. I forget what it is. And where did that blood go? Fall down and hit the ground? Hmm? Fall down and hit the ground, right? Are you thinking with me now? Yeah. Yeah, what's the ground? It, was, it left in the, was it left in the ground? No. <laughs> there you <laughs> Never. <laughs> Wasn't left in the ground? Well, when he rose from the dead, his body completely arose. And everything that had anything to do with his body. And blood that was shed was shed. That shed blood. And that's the blood that washes your sins away. Well, you know, I can't prove that. And I won't try to. I just, sometimes I'll give you something like that to just kind of mess you up, make you think. But it's okay to think, isn't it? Think about that, though. Think about it. You say, well, that's, well why wouldn't, what's wrong with it being mixed up in the dirt? Well, you know, it does say in the book of Hebrews, they have trampled underfoot the blood of the Son of God. But that's a figurative speech. That's a figure of speech. You, are you following me there? Because, for example, you reject Christ, the, these Jews there in the first century, they reject him, but it doesn't mean that they're at the cross where the blood was shed. Are you following me? They're not at the cross where the blood was shed so they could physically trample it under their feet. It's a figurative expression that wherever they are, by rejecting his sacrifice, figuratively, they're trampling under their feet the blood of God. What does that go to? That goes to the night when the death angel came through Egypt and the blood was over the doorpost, right? And the lintel, but it was not under their feet. It was never to be walked on. Well, anyway, 
I'll probably get somebody to say that. And Lawson's a heretic, and I knew he was. He's crazy. I probably am, but I'm happy, amen. <laughs> that drives him mad. <laughs> no, I don't know that I have the answer, but I know that it makes me think. That blood's something, folks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Father, thank you for your word and the time we've had together. Bless it, Lord, of the hearts of the people. We praise your holy name. Some folk believe that this is Wednesday, Lord. And it was three o'clock this afternoon that you cried, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And your body was laid in the tomb. There are those who believe it was on Friday and those on Thursday. But my father tonight, I believe it was Wednesday. And I believe that gives us three days and three nights in the tomb. But there's no question about this. On that third day, yeah. on that Sunday morning, anytime after 6 p.m. Saturday, anytime after 6 p.m. Saturday, you could have arisen from the dead. We know that without doubt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.